Hey, it's Catherine Kemp Gaile, and you're listening to 360 Entrepreneur with Jan Alunga. This is episode 227, and this one is all about strategic self publishing. Here we go. Welcome to the 360 Entrepreneur Podcast, the show for entrepreneurs and small business owners who dream big and want to do bigger. Join some of the world's top entrepreneurs, internet marketers, and best-selling authors as they share their inspiring stories, their struggles, and give actionable tips that will help you build, grow, and promote your online business. Here's your host, Yanni Lunga. Hey there, how's it going? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yanni Lunga here, as always. And today's episode brings us back in time. The last time we covered self-publishing was months and months ago. So I thought it'd be a good idea to go back to the topic because it's something that is still really, really popular. And it's something you actually may have been thinking about. I know I've definitely been thinking about it. And in fact, Next year, it's finally going to be my first year as an author. I've been working on my first book and I'll be sharing some details about it very, very soon. But I can tell you next year, your pal Jan is going to be an author. In today's episode, we are joined by a good friend of mine and client, Catherine Kemp Gaile, who knows a lot and I mean a lot about self-publishing and she has quite a good advice to share with us in terms of the overall process, mistakes, what to think about. And we're also going to touch upon the costs. It's important for you to have a real understanding of what's behind the overall self-publishing process. The show notes page for today's episode are over at yanilunga.com for a slash episode 227. All right, time to get started. Here's the interview with Catherine Kemp Gaile from MakeEverythingFun.com. Hey, everybody. I'm really, really excited about who's joining us today. She's somebody who has inspired tens of thousands of individuals, just like you and I, to be happier, healthier, and have more fun. As the founder of Make Everything Fun, she's a coach, teacher, speaker, and prolific author. Through her courses, she has a course on make publishing fun, make nutrition fun, and make wellness fun. She helps others spread their own message to make the world a better place. If this wasn't enough, she has also received dozens of awards for her writing and coaching work. She has been seen on many places like ABC, CBS, Fox, NPR, And if you thought that was it, you're wrong. She also hosts two podcasts and she's here with us. I'm so excited to welcome on the show one of my favorite clients and people, Catherine Kemp Gale. Hi, Catherine. How's it going? I'm so excited to be with you today, Jan, and your wonderful listeners. And as you were reading that introduction or talking about all the things that I'm up to, I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm really glad I got a great night's sleep last night because that sounds like a lot of stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, that's all you. So you should pat yourself on the shoulder. That's definitely quite the impressive resume, but we all know that it's not something that happens over overnight. It's something that really required a lot of work. And today I want to ask you for some advice on self-publishing and the, the author word. It's something that we haven't covered here on the podcast for quite a lot of time. And I remember the first few episodes of the podcast, I think around 20 or something like that, episode 16, 17, up to 20, we covered self-publishing. So I think it's a good idea to go back to a topic that can be of use for many people here. Are you ready, Catherine, to dive into the topic? I think it's such an important topic, so I am always ready. (laughs) Great, yeah. I know with you, that's kind of a rhetorical question because I know you're always ready to inspire and help others. So I think the first question I have to ask you to really get the conversation on self-publishing started here is kind of a general question. Is If there is somebody here with you and I, Catherine, who is an entrepreneur, they run their own business, and maybe they've been thinking about book publishing. Yes, no. What would you say publishing a book can do for entrepreneurs? 
It can change your life. It can change your business. And I know that's very broad. And so I'll get specific. In fact, I like to ask this question on my podcast, Positive Unpublishing, and on my summit that I did, even people who are considered celebrities, Marcy Shimoff. When I asked her what publishing a book did for her, she said, Catherine, that's when my platform really took off. And it's Mm -hmm. so funny that she used that word platform because a lot of people maybe 10 years ago were thinking, oh, I had to build my platform before I had a book. And it was sort of this chicken and an egg thing, like which comes first? Does your platform come first or does your book come first? And what I think is so exciting today is that your book can come first. It can be a huge part of building your platform. If you have a message that you want to share with the world, a book is an incredible way to share that message. And what it does is it does what we all want is it builds that platform and it also gives you content that you can repurpose to continue to build your platform. And what you find is that it is this like juggernaut experience where once you get a book out into the world, opportunity starts to knock. What I really liked about what you just shared with us, Catherine, is that you're you're basically saying that it is possible to leverage the power of publishing a book, even if we are just getting started if our pub, uh, our platform hasn't been built or isn't established yet. So that's definitely exciting. If you're here with Catherine and I, and you've been thinking about writing a book, whether you're getting started or you have been in business for 20 years, I, as you heard, Catherine just said it. Publishing a book can bring a lot of opportunities your way. And should we, Catherine, try to share some examples i know you you have a few i i'm working on my on my on my first book so i haven't had the the pleasure yet but what are some of the things that can come as a result of having a book published obviously i think I, one one addition i want to make here is that i think that's important for us to address Catherine, because i'm sure you've seen this a lot where many people think well i'm just going to publish a book and i'm going to become a new york times best selling author i'm going to become a millionaire and that's it but it's actually not really the case correct yes and i try to be the voice of reason in this market that says that a book isn't necessarily going to make you rich overnight i mean it's not this get quick Uh, rich scheme or (laughs) get rich quick scheme. That's not how it works. For some people it does. And so I'm not saying that that won't happen. I'm just saying based on the extensive research that I've done in the market, I've interviewed authors across traditionally published books, across self-published books, and across hybrid published, which is basically like an author subsidized way of of going to market, which is very legitimate today. It's, It's partnering with a publishing company, a publishing services company to get your book out. I've surveyed all these people and I've asked incredibly detailed questions about their goals, about their achievement to goal, about their happiness factor, about how much they spent, about how much they received, about how much they gained from their book financially. And what I saw is very consistent with what I had read. And I kind of wanted to do the survey to validate that. I'm a management consultant um, by background. And I did a lot of studies in my career as a management consultant. And I found that having that objective outside unwashed um, unbiased data could be really powerful. So this information about you know getting rich quick, I think I dispelled in my survey. It's really more about, first of all, you have to understand your goals. And I do have a course on publishing where I walk people through the 10 reasons why you might want write, to write a book. And I think it's so important to start with your why, because your why is then going to drive some of your decision making, of course, through your process. But if you're if you're out to write a book to make money, then you might want to do different things versus if you're out to write a book for altruism, which by the Mm -hmm. way, I I wrote two of my books for that. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can also write book uh, books for authority. And there's a lot of reasons to do that, obviously. And then there's books, um, you know, to really launch your business where you're putting a lot of links in the book and you're really talking about your back end business and you're driving people towards that business. Because by the way, by the time they're done with the book, they really understand what your value is, and they're excited to be in touch with you. So there's a lot of reasons and a lot of ways the book can benefit, but it's really important to start with that why first. I love what you just share share with us, Catherine. And I like the fact that this conversation is touching really on the key questions, on the core elements. We're not talking about 
writing tips or those kind of things because those don't really matter if you don't have a, a, a why that you have identified. And, and you said there are different ways we can go about it. You said you have published a couple of books as altruism. One, as you, as you pointed out, could leverage the book as an asset to direct people toward the business, toward their email list, toward coaching services. One may be providing products or services. One may be selling. So it's really important, as you said, to really take time to think about the why. And you mentioned you have a course with uh, with advice on, on kind of the 10 steps related to identifying your, your why or 10 reasons why you may want to start a book. And like in every episode, I'll make sure to link to that, your website and everything else we were covering here in the show notes. One thing I want to ask you, Catherine, that uh, is related to publishing still, and it's again a, a reality check kind of question, has to do with the steps and costs involved in the book publishing process. You touched upon this on passant a little bit a couple of minutes ago when you started to, to mention a couple of uh, companies, stakeholders, individuals that can be part of the book publishing process. So without uh, making things too complicated or too technical, could you, Catherine, try to summarize a little bit and tell everybody what a book publishing process typically looks like, number one, and number two, what are some of the costs involved in that? Sure. And I'll just give you the broad steps in the process of, mm -hmm. of idea to yeah. marketing and publicity. So the book development process is everything from the logistics of ISBN. And this is assuming that you're doing your book either through self or hybrid. If you're a traditionally published author, you're given an advance and the publishing house takes care of all of the development steps, all of the printing, all of the distribution, and some of the marketing and publicity depending on your, your contract. So when I'm talking about some of the costs related to the development of the book and the distribution and the marketing and the, and the printing and the publicity, this is really for a self-published author or maybe a hybrid published author. But the development is really the, like I said, the logistics, the ISBN, getting your barcode. Those are really small expenses. I wouldn't even worry too much about it, but there are some companies out there that will, char will charge you anywhere between $600 to $1,000 just to do those very simple things. So the first thing mm -hmm. I would tell people is, you know, go to Boker, B-O-W-K-E-R, Boker, and, and just see that you can buy a barcode for $25. I think in some countries you can get ISBNs for free. I know in Canada you can, for example. In the U.S. you have to buy them but they're not very expensive. And that's the beginning of your process. That's when you say, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to, you know, sort of reserve this spot in the marketplace mm -hmm. with my ISBN. And then of course, there's the whole writing and there's the editing and editing is not just a single step. It's some books need developmental editing, some most, most of them, all of them actually, I think, need copy editing. And most books, mm -hmm. if you're a first-time author, could use a good developmental edit. And some people call that structural, but just really, I think it's so important to get the bones of your book really, really in place before you start to put the organs in, you know, because if you mm -hmm. just start to dump everything into a non-systemized uh, structure, then it can be really messy and it actually can be more expensive if you have to go back. In fact, there's a, a whole marketplace under book doctoring. It's what it's called. And <laughs> it's funny that it almost sounds medical. I talked about bones right, and then yeah. organs <laughs> and a book doctor. Um, <laughs> and then people talk about book as, books as babies. But um, it, it can be a mess if you don't get it right the first time. So editing goes from developmental or structural through copy copy editing through proofreading. And that's probably the most important pro uh, part of the de developmental stage. Although a lot of people will argue that the cover design is so critical. And then you've got the back cover, the spine, the interior design is so critical that your book, people will really open up a book in a bookstore. And if it doesn't look pretty and you don't really realize as an author the importance of the how it's laid out. But if mm -hmm. it doesn't look pretty, people aren't going to want to spend 10 hours with it. So it's really important that how you present your material is is well done. And that's all part of development. That also includes the ebook development because you have to, you know, transfer the the interior design into an ebook. And it's not as easy as it seems. It can a lot of ebooks mm -hmm. can be faulted. 
for not having the the correct trans uh, transcribing of it. And then we get into how you're going to distribute your book and you might want to do offset printing and that's sort of the printing process or you might want to do digital. That's getting into a lot of nitty gritty, but I would tell a new time author just to go with print on demand. They, It's so different than 10 years ago. You don't need a big capital expense or cash outlay to get your book done. You can just print on demand through Create Space or through Ing- Ingram Spark. And um, get your books um, distributed through Amazon and actually even through bookstores if you go through Ingram Spark. So the world has really opened up as related to book distribution. I just really caution that that people still, because there isn't that gatekeeper of the big publishing companies, because most people are not working with them anymore, we that we still have our own quality control. It's like podcasting, Jan. Podcasting has in many ways opened up the gates of media to so many people. And so we ourselves need to get together and have quality standards so that we're putting good content out there. And then I'll just say, once you have your book you know, printed and distributed and it's out into the world, there is a lot to do in marketing and publicity. So I have a survey that I'm happy to share with your listeners that kind of goes through all those steps and it talks about you know, high, low, median, average, 25 percent and, and 75 percent costs across different types of authors. And it's a really meaty 40-page survey. But if you really want to get into the costs of publishing, that's a great resource. I'm happy to share. Yeah, no, absolutely. It sounds it sounds like a very valuable resource. And to everybody who's joining us, keep in mind that reading 40 pages, you may think, ah, oh, well, that sounds like it's going to take some time. Yeah, sure. But educating yourself is something that really is worth taking the time because down the line, it may help you save time and money, correct? Oh, yes. And for those people that want to just dip their toe in, I'll do a six page version of it because I have a short version and a long version. <laughs> okay, so so Catherine was really nice. And <laughs> kind of she, uh, she cut you some slack a little bit. But <laughs> what you share with us, Catherine, I think is very powerful and provides a bird's eye view of what a, a book publishing process typically looks like. And it goes without saying that Nowadays, you hear people who say, well, yeah, just write a book uh, on in, in Word and you just put it your, uh, on Amazon yourself. Don't, don't worry about anything, basically. And, you know, that's something I personally wouldn't recommend doing. As you said, Catherine, the fact that uh, uh, publishing companies aren't having so much control anymore doesn't mean that it's okay to create something that is bad quality, whether it's bad in terms of the, the content, the formatting, the, the cover, and you made the example of podcasts and, you know, the same thing can be said for podcasts. Just because you can now uh, be a podcaster and share your message through audio doesn't mean that it's okay to record from your bathroom with an echo and your computer built in microphone. So I like the, the analogy you share there. And is there something, Catherine, you, you maybe want to add when it comes to, to the process or would you say that that's pretty Pretty much it when it comes to really thinking about it at first step. I just want to reiterate the importance of quality. Just like you said, you wouldn't record your podcast from your bathroom with echoing walls and a terrible microphone. This is a reflection of who you are and your message and how important it is. And yes, the content is really important, but how we package it in this world, because there is so much content out there. We need to do the best to package it in a way that is really user friendly, that the user experience is wonderful. And so whether it's a podcast or it's a book, both of those things, the quality is so important because it's a representation of you and your outreach to the world. Yeah, amen. I I love what you just shared there with us. And I want to ask you a question, Catherine, actually related to the content of the book. If there is somebody here with you and I who already has a platform, perhaps they've been blogging for a few years, or they have a podcast, or maybe they've been guests on podcasts, or they often go and present at conferences and things like that. Would you say that is a good idea to look at the body of work we may have already created through the blog, the podcast or something else as maybe the core content for the actual book? It's not a good idea. It's a great idea. And that's all about repurposing content. What I would urge people to do, though, is that you really... So there's this idea that you 
get a cabin and you get your computer and you write a book, <laughs> you sit down and you write. That's actually not a great process for efficiency and for effectiveness. The first thing that needs to be done is, yes, you can look at your body of content because you have so much great stuff if you're already blogging, if you're already podcasting, if you're already creating content in other ways, likely you have great stuff already. So then the next question is, what is that structure that that, you know, putting the bones in place, like I talked about before, before you Mm -hmm. start putting the organs in. And it's interesting because I have done books both ways. I have done books where I sort of sat down and I started to write. And let me tell you, (laughs) it was a mess. That was my first book, Mountain Mantras, and it needed a couple of developmental edits. It took a long time. I was very proud of the end product, but I was exhausted. Then I found Carol Klein, who has 13 books, several New York Times number one best-selling books, and is an incredible writer. And I learned a lot with her. In fact, she and I are working on a course together about how to write your nonfiction book. And it's about honing, honing your craft. It's about creating a structure. It's about, and there's all these really cool things that she was reminding me about, like you can use metaphors and alliterations and other kinds mm-hmm. of structures to really not just plop your reader into your life. And she talks about being at gradient, really being able to connect at the same level because you yawn and you listener, you have so much in your brain that your reader is not going to. So how do you bring your reader to gradient? It's so important. It's like you're in a house of knowledge. And if you don't bring your reader to gradient, it's like the threshold is like six feet high and they have to like jump up in order to get into your house. And that's asking too much. So it's really... It's really about taking that content, but first finding structure, honing your craft, really understanding how you can make your content at gradient and take your reader through a journey that makes sense to them. So that's what that structure provides, where it's very difficult if you just sit down and start writing and see where it takes you. Like that might be a fun way to do a journal or to work on your just creative outlet, but to write a book that's really user-friendly, you need to start with your structure. Those are those are very good pointers you share, Catherine. And as I was listening to you, as I, I was thinking yeah, early on, you made an analogy between publishing and podcasting when it came to the quality. And a similar thing can be said for what you just said. So, for example, when it comes to the the way the content is presented, the language we use, metaphors, and all those kind of things. A similar thing can be said for podcasting. If you host a podcast that is educational or informational, you could simply say, well, okay, welcome to another episode. So today, Catherine and I are going to tell you about book publishing. So do this and then this and then this. We are doing the same thing we're doing right now because we are providing information. However, if we were to have that attitude, maybe that monotone voice or approach <laughs> without our energy, or we wouldn't have any structure what, whatsoever, I personally would, would say that the, the listening experience would be different and so would the reading experience when it comes to the book. So thank you, Catherine, for pointing those out. And I want to ask you a question. Uh, I have two questions for you. One has to do with the marketing side of things in case there is somebody joining us who has a book already or has the book that is almost ready to go. And I want to ask you, because I know you have leveraged this personally, and is the role you think podcasts play when it comes to building buzz around our book? Is it a good idea to go on a virtual book tour where we try to get featured on podcasts around the release of our uh, book? Oh, it's so funny because I told you (laughs) this morning that I was invited to be on our local TV station this morning and they're a little last minute and that's just the way TV works and you have to get up at four in the morning and all that because I don't mind that part. (laughs) But the fact was I had Jan on my calendar this morning and the 360 (laughs) entrepreneur and I said no to that TV um, interview, not only because you were first, but because of the power of podcasting and that being this evergreen, wonderful content that's always going to circulate for your message. So I guess I'd say a couple things about a virtual tour for your book. And first of all, I do think that podcasting is the most powerful way Mm -hmm. to get your 
to get your book messages going. The thing I would say, though, is that I wouldn't look at a podcast interview as a way to just sit and talk about your book. Right. In, in fact, if you had introduced me, Jan, and I started talking about one of my books or several of my books or saying, well, in chapter three, you can go read that and blah, 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 but you have to buy it first. I, I think you probably wouldn't play the interview, right? And <laughs> we wouldn't be yeah. friends. Because- yeah. And as we were saying early on, also the listening experience would be terrible. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's really important to develop your mindset first around your marketing and publicity outreach. You are there as an author to serve the world. And if you make some money with your book, it's probably going to be mostly on the the back end side. It's about growing your business and your authority and your expertise. And so it's a little bit hard to to track it all, but you just have to have that faith and that mindset that by sharing your valuable messages with the world that you'll receive value in in return. But I think that that is the first place to start, whether it's a virtual mar- uh, marketing publicity tour or whether it's you know, going in person to events or workshops or, you know, getting on TV or doing, you know, there's all kinds of things to do, guest um, blog posts, getting in magazines, there's all kinds of ways to get your message out there. But the mindset is the first thing. Just like when we talked about the book writing process, getting your why really clear, that's important for that piece of the process. But when it comes to the marketing publicity, it's about getting the right mindset. And the mindset is to serve and to provide value first. Amen to that. You you said it, Catherine. And and thank you again because I thanked you already <laughs> before we started. Thank you for for being here and saying to the to the TV people, sorry, I have a podcast interview. <laughs> and <laughs> and you said podcasting can be very powerful, but it it what you just told us, I think ties into what we're talking about early on when you talked about your why. And that's something that it's true also for leveraging podcasts to build awareness about your your book. Why do you want to do it? And if you think that the way to do it is what you, Catherine, just told us not to do, and that is show up and talk about the book, the entire interview, that doesn't make for an interesting conversation at all. And that's an almost far sure way to have people not buy your book. So it's about building a connection, sharing, uh, uh, providing listeners with advice and really make a great listening experience. And I want to bring this term again, the experience, because it's something that I think is very important, as you were saying also early on when it comes to reading and, you know, the reader's brain, the listener's brain, and the way they kind of experience the book or the podcast interview. So that's very important. And there is another question here that I want to ask you. And it's something that we talked about on the Podcast Success Summit as well. The Podcast Success Summit is coming up and Catherine and I have a panel of discussion on self-publishing, podcasting, audiobooks. So if the conversation Catherine and I are having right now sounds interesting, you definitely want to join us on the Podcast Success Summit. I want to ask you this question, Catherine, that I asked you there as well, because I I think it's so powerful and it can really open the eyes to those who may have a book already and they thought, okay, I just have to focus on selling as many copies of my book as possible. And the question is this, what are some ways authors can profit from their book other than book sales, that is? And I think it's really, that's the the other things, the non-book sale things are really where the profit lies, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to your why and what those metrics should be. So again, if it's an an altruism book, like my, you know, Eat a Rainbow books were for kids, my metric wasn't even doing more workshops or more events, like that wasn't part of what I wanted to do. I really Mm -hmm. wanted just to reach more kids and hear from parents and teachers that their kids were eating more vegetables and having fun and Mm -hmm. behavior changes and health. So for me, that was my metric. And whether that's a profit or not, to me, that was what I was looking for. And so again, you go back to your why, you, you figure out what your why is, and then you start to build metrics. But if you're looking for financial metrics, I think it's really important sure to look at book sales, but also to look at all the things that are related to what is profitable for you, for your revenue streams. You can actually include 
links to your podcast episodes if you're a podcaster and you can look at your downloads and do your download mm-hmm. spike once your book comes out. That's a really great thing. Again, if you're talking about your podcast and your book and you're, and you're mentioning it and you're getting people interested in it, then you might see a spike there. Or if you're talking about how you work with, I'm just coming up with an example, with companies to you know, to do facilitation and you have a story and it's a really great story of transformation in your book and you have something, then you put a link in there that says, you know, for more information about how I work with companies on, on these transformational projects, please, you know, click, click here Mm -hmm. and the, your reader lets, it would be great to look at your Google analytics and are more people coming, are you getting more traffic? And then are you actually getting more clients that are signing up for that service? So I really think it's important again to go back to that why, but remember that your book, the more tight it can be, the more niche down it can be to the reader that you're trying to reach. And then really be very also tight in that objective, whether it's to get more podcast listeners or get more att- you know, attendance at your workshops or get more clients. You want to tell stories to that point so that you're getting people, if, you, if you're, for example, if I were talking to an author and they said, I'm really disappointed because I published my book and my, you know, no, I didn't see any spikes in people asking me to come speak for them. Right. And then I would say, well, how much did you talk about your speaking in the book and how it's transformational and really helping, whether it's you know individuals, whatever your target market is, you know, did you tell a bunch of stories in there to get people excited about what you're doing? And if they say no, then I'd say, well then it wasn't a marketing <laughs> tool for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's those are some of the profit is a pretty general word, but again, it all goes back to the why is what are the reasons for your book, then what are your metrics and then how do you measure it? Man, but Catherine, I don't even know what to say. What you share, it's so powerful. And and this this last example that you mentioned about the speaking, you know, that that's that in itself says it all. And keep in mind that Depending on how your business is structured and so forth, you landing one client will probably top you uh, selling several dozens, if not even hundreds of the copies of your book. So keep in mind that if up until now you've been focusing only on on pushing book sales, as Catherine said, the, the profit actually lays in other things as well. So definitely take Catherine's advice to heart. And Catherine, this has been a fun interview. And to wrap it up, I have two quick final questions for you. The first one is if somebody would like to connect with you, to ask you questions, give you shout outs or learn from you, what would you say is the best way to do that? Well, I have a hub website, thanks to you, Jan, and that is makeeverythingfun.com. And there I have links to all of my social media platforms. So that's really the best way to reach me. Great. So uh, again, make sure to check out the show notes page and there you're going to find the links to the website Catherine just mentioned, as well as everything else we mentioned, her podcast, books, and everything else. And the final question, Catherine, is, Is there anything you want to add, anything you want to double down on, or maybe something we forgot to say when it comes to book publishing, the why, the publishing journey? Well, I'll just, I'll tell folks that I came from a household where I had a scientist father and an artist mother. And I feel like I grew up in an environment. I'm older than you, Jan. I don't know if you if you felt this way as well. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, I didn't know. <laughs> well, I don't know if you felt this that that there was this um, pull between art and science. And I mm-hmm. feel like today there's this pull between business and the woo-woo, right? Or whatever that means to people. And I'm really on a mission to bridge that gap between, I actually like heart-centered leadership as opposed to a woo, but to really bring a little bit of heart, dare I say love, into the business world and kind of bring, you know, I think science and and religion are starting to get a little bit better along and is in Mm. art as well. But I'd really like to see that be something that we that we heal as a society. I think it'll help to change the world. And um, I just wanted to, to tell people that that story. I think that kind of is a, a important nutshell about the person that I am and the the purpose that I really feel like I have on this planet. Well, there you have it. Some final inspiring words from Catherine Camp Galay. 
Catherine, I want to say thank you so much for, first of all, for what you do for your time and for your advice. I really, really appreciate it and had a great time interviewing you. And I can offer a gift to your listeners, right? Absolutely. Please feel free to do so. So at makeeverythingfun.com slash 360, we talked a lot about that author survey, the 40-page report, as well as the shorter page, the six-page report. I'll put both of those there so that if people are interested in, in getting further information about that question you asked about how much does it cost to publish a book, I'll have that for them. So if you're interested in that, I'm happy to share that because Jan is such a dear friend and such a great leader for this community. So it's fun just to, to spread the love. Well, thank you, Catherine. And you heard what Catherine said. It's Christmas. So make sure to go to the show notes page and you can access the resources Catherine mentioned so that you can learn more about the industry, the costs and what you need to think about and do to publish your book and profit from it. And we are back. You heard it. I mentioned it toward the end of the interview. Catherine and I are actually going to talk about self-publishing even more on the upcoming Podcast Success Summit. Catherine is going to be joined by two other speakers, Sarah Ria Werner and Crystal Washer, for a panel about self-publishing, audiobooks, and podcasting. In case you haven't heard about it yet, I'm organizing an online conference, the Podcast Success Summit. It's going to take place online, as I said, from September 18th to the 22nd. And this year's edition is all about helping podcasters like you and I. So if you have a podcast, make sure to check out the show notes page for today's episode, yanilunga.com for slash episode 227, because there you find the links to everything Catherine and I have talked about, including the link to the Podcast Success Summit. Is the summit gone as you're listening to me right now? No problem. On the summit page, there is actually the all access pass that gives you lifetime access to all the sessions. So whether you're listening to this and the summit is about to happen or the summit has gone already, you can still get access through the all access pass. A final note, Catherine mentioned a couple of resources and you'll find the link to those in the show notes page as well. This is it for today. In the next episode, we're going to focus on content and how to approach it to really stand out in your niche. Thank you for listening to the 360 Entrepreneur Podcast. For more tips and tools, head over to www.janilunga.com.